We're going to be continuing in our study this morning through the book of Romans. So if you need a Bible, uh, I'd love for you to raise your hand so that you can follow along with us what the, uh, the words of the Apostle Paul this morning in Romans 4, verses 1 through 12. And um, this morning I've called our message a carved faith or carved faith. And, and the reason why is because, um, you know, faith is something that's, that's worked on. Faith isn't something that automatically happens. Yes, we come to the Lord, we're justified, we're saved, but then God continues to bring things in our lives, does he not, to, uh, to, to bolster our faith so that we can even have stronger faith. And so it's a, it's a faith that, that's worked on. It's not immediate, in other words. It's not, it's not automatic. At least it wasn't for me. Um, because God had to show me things. And sometimes he'll do it through trials. Sometimes he'll do it through um, tribulations. Sometimes he'll do it through times of doubting. Um, different things like that he will bring into our lives that will cause us to get onto our knees and we will have more faith or desire more faith to go through the situation that we're currently in. Faith, I think, has uh, takes time to be produced, if you will. It takes time then to be reproduced, and sometimes God will allow us to go through things yet again, or a, or, or a multitude of things, so that our faith can continue to be growing and growing and growing. And I think also there's things that God just plainly wants us to trust Him in, right? I mean, how many times have you asked God, when is this going to be over, or, or, or how do I navigate through this situation, and, and God just doesn't give you an answer, right? He, he just doesn't answer you. Yet we keep on asking, we keep on seeking, we keep on knocking, right? And, and in that seeking, asking, and knocking, God is actually, even though you don't know it, God is building your faith. God is bolstering your faith because he's causing you to draw near to him. And that's the whole idea. And I believe that's why he's silent on many things that we may ask of him, right? Because he wants us to grow, to get closer to him and get closer to him, almost like John the Beloved who leaned upon the chest of, of our Lord and I can imagine just heard his heartbeat, you know? What would that be like? Hear the heartbeat of Jesus. And I think in order to hear the heartbeat, we gotta get close to him, right? And so during our times, God wants us to hear his heartbeat and get really close to him. And yet he's, he's, he's carving out our faith for a purpose, and the purpose is so that it is something that other people are going to see, right? They're, they're, they're going to see you walk through this time of faith. He, someone told, told me a long time ago, or I heard on a message somewhere, that uh, you know, there, there's, there's a faith that, that, that I know that I want to have, and it's called a faith that's called a through faith. And it's a faith that carries me through the dilemma. It's a faith that carries me through the circumstance, it's the faith that carries me through the trial. And, and that's the kind of faith I want. And, and the idea of that kind of faith is that God is, is carving that out in your life and in my life for the purpose of something that some other people will see. Maybe God is doing something in your life right now that's going to take a lot of faith because you don't see the end. Maybe you're in the tunnel and maybe it's kind of dark and yet you don't see the light at the end of that tunnel just yet. But God is doing something and the purpose is that as you go through that tunnel and you go to the light, guess what? That's going to be a testimony for other people to see. It's something for others so they can see your testimony of faith. We, we've used the idiom or the example a lot of the time, uh, nails in a coffin or nails in the coffin. And, and what that means, basically, it's an action or event that, that leads to the end of something. I, I, can, I can assure you that when I was in Okinawa, the time of my sickness um, was such to where um, I was like, Lord, hey, it's okay. You want to take me now? I'm good. I mean, I was okay with it, Lord. You know, I'm you know, having that little pity party for myself a little bit, right? And, and so I'm like, Lord, you know what? This is not fun. This is not good. Uh, there's a lot of things that I would rather be doing with the team and with the churches, but I'm not able to. And yet God is faithful and strengthened. Um, I, it still was something that, um, 
that I was like just ready. I'm done. Stick a fork in me. I'm finished, right? And, and, and that, that whole thing, but yet I was reminded, God reminded me of a message that I taught some weeks ago um, through the book of Acts. And it was Paul, and it was going through that time of, of the, um, uh, this being shipwrecked and the storm and all of that. And, and the teaching that I had was uh, one of which was called um, uh, an expected end. And I had to keep reminding myself as God reminded me. It's like, Tom, this is going to end. You just don't know when. Now, I'm just talking about being sick. But there may be something way more difficult or way more um, heavy on your life right now. And you're wondering, Lord, is this going to end? Well, I assure you, and I promise you, it will end. Because God is going to see you through that. And that's the kind of faith we're, that I'm talking about, is this faith that has a through faith. And, and so Paul now, in chapter 4, as we get into it, Paul is going to add three nails to the coffin, three more nails to the coffin of salvation by faith, plus anything. I mean, that's kind of a question. Salvation by faith, plus anything? Is it salvation by faith through baptism? Is it salvation by faith through works? Is it salvation by faith to uh, plus um, uh, uh, just being a good person? Is that how it works? Is that, is that what the scriptures teach us? Well, here Paul's going to lay out really what the reformers back in the 1500s declared, which was faith alone. Faith alone. Just faith and only faith. Charles Spurgeon says this, any church which puts in the place of justification by faith in Christ another method of salvation is a harlot church. That's, that's a Pretty big indictment, right? But that's true in the sense that if we're trying to add to the salvation by faith, then that is definitely heresy and harlotry because we can't add to it. It is salvation by faith. Ephesians 2.8 says that for by grace we have been saved by faith. And so in this, I want us to go over, as Mike, the last couple Sundays, had been talking through chapter 3 about this word, this theological word that I don't want you to get tripped up on called justification. I don't want to simplify it either, but I don't want you to get tripped up over that word. And truly, this, this justification, I've got four points. You can see two up there right now. It's a process by which an individual is brought into an unmerited right relationship with God. Number one, it's unmerited. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But just by the virtue of who God is and us coming to him, that we are justified, we are saved, made clean immediately, and we are right with God. Our relationship is right with God. There's no longer enmity. There's no longer uh, hatred of the things of God. Also, it doesn't encompass the whole salvation process, uh, justification, uh, sanctification, our walk and glorification when we're with the Lord. But, it's a, but it is, um, in point three, it does mark that instantaneous point of entry that makes a person right with God. It's the moment you say yes to Jesus, understand this, okay? The moment you say yes to the Lord, it's instantaneous, we are justified. We're justified. If any of you are here this morning and you're wondering, well, let me encourage you through the words of Apostle Paul and through the Scripture that your if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you've asked him to be Lord and Savior over your life, it is instantaneous. It's a point of entry you now have with Jesus that makes you right or righteous before God. God takes your sin and God then trades it in for and gives you his righteousness. No longer your own, but his 
and his alone. Unlike Roman Catholicism, I grew up in Roman Catholicism my entire life. Went to Catholic universities and, and, and the whole gamut, high school and so forth. Whereas a person is justified over a period of time. You never know if you're saved or not. You never know if you're there or not. You're not sure because you're earning everything. You're working through things. You're earning and earning and trying to earn your way into heaven. So there's those, those areas of infant baptism. There's a lifetime of works. There's purgatory. Hey, when a person dies, they don't even go to heaven. They go into this place called purgatory. And then there's glorification when you finally make it from that one place into heaven. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that quite clearly. And we as Protestants, we, we, we see that justification is instantaneous. It's immediate. Paul in chapter 4 gives kind of a postscript to chapter 3. Kind of a PS. And what he's saying is, hey, by the way, let me encourage you by the writings of Moses and the writings of King David that, you know what, this isn't any some new doctrine I'm telling you about. He says, look it up for yourself. Let's go back to the book of Moses, the books of Moses. Let's go back to the Psalms of David even. And there's two parts of three parts that we'll be looking at in chapter four. This morning, the first two, which is wiping out works and ripping ritual. Taking away works altogether. God has taken the, the, that whiteboard and he's taken that eraser and he's wrote works. It was works that was written on there and then uh, he's wiped it clean. Works is, is, is not in the economy of God. It's not in the mind of God. And then also ripping of the ritual. And we're going to talk about that in the area of circumcision. We'll leave the final part of the law for next week. But in verses 1 through 8 of chapter 4 of Romans, follow along with me as we go through the first eight verses together. Paul says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Here, 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 just as a quick note, Abraham, or Paul is quoting from Genesis chapter 15, verse 3, uh, or verse 6, but um, we'll, we, we'll read it through here. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt, because he's saying, listen, you, you, you worked, and so someone owes you something. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David, verse 6, also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Very important to understand. Read your Bibles, look at this, because it, because it, and underline it, because this is something that I think we all struggle with. We all struggle with feeling like we're not good enough. We all struggle with feeling like we're not doing enough for the Lord. But here, quite frankly, it tells us that God gives us, imputes to us, adds to our account righteousness apart from works. Meaning, Paul says, the Bible declares, it's not about works. He says in verse 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Paul seems to say, um, okay, hmm, let me think. Who, who would be the best example in our Jewish history that would, in effect, represent or prove that God's righteousness comes by faith and not by works. Who, who is it that I could think of or bring as a first witness or testimony of this? 
And it's interesting as a side note to note this, that Abraham is one of the few individuals in the, in the monotheistic or the one God following, mono being one, following God, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, they, they're the only three out of everywhere else that they're actually saying, uh, that, that they're actually uh, esteem Abraham as their father. Father Abraham, we say that, right? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham, right? Takes you back to those days in children's ministry. I want to read to you a, a more modern translation, easier translation than the New King James, that might make it just a little bit more understandable for us this morning. Verses 2 through 5, it, it alliterates this way. So how do we fit, and, and it's not up on the screen or anything, so just kind of give me your ears, right? Isn't that, is that what they say? So how do we fit what we know of Abraham? our first father of the faith, into this new way of looking at things. If Abraham, by what God, by what he did for God, got God to approve him, he could certainly have taken credit for it. But the story we're given is a God story, not an Abraham story. We read, what we read in Scripture is, Abraham entered into what God was doing for him. And that was the turning point. He trusted God to set him right instead of to being trying to be right on his own. If you're a hard worker and do a good job, you deserve your pay. We don't call your wages a gift, but you see that the job is too big for you, that it's something only God can do, and you trust him to do it. You could never do it for yourself, no matter how hard and how long you worked. Well, that trusting him to do it is what gets you set right with God, by God. It's a sheer gift. You see, that's what the Apostle Paul is declaring in here. That salvation is that gift. Hey, I, I know when someone gives me a gift, I didn't shop for it. I didn't pay for it. I didn't go around looking for it. I didn't even think about it. It's a gift. I did nothing to earn it. I did nothing to receive it. And that's what the Apostle Paul in the Bible is declaring to us this morning, that in just by faith alone, by trusting him to do it, because we can't, you can't, that in that, in the context of what we're studying this morning, justification, that it's all by faith and nothing else. Paul is trying to prove the point here, and he will prove the point quite clearly, that it is all by faith and not by works. In verse 3 of chapter 4, it says, For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So what is that saying to you and I? Well, it's saying that basically that Abraham, he trusted in God's goodness. God is good, right? God ain't bad. God's good. And everything that flows from God is good. The Bible declares to us and says that every good gift that comes from above comes from the Father of lights. So everything that comes from the Lord is good. Abraham trusted, he believed in the goodness of God. He believed that God would keep his word. Well, that's novel, isn't it? Believing God at his word. Maybe there's some of you here this morning that just don't quite believe God at his word. That if he says, if you put your faith in me, that if you declare with your mouth that I am your Lord, you confess, you repent, guess what? You are justified. You are saved. But instead, like myself or maybe some others, even following this conversion that we have, we still have the tendency to think we got to work at it. we got to earn it. 
And I don't fault any of us for that because we live in a world that is based upon performance. Any of us who have ever worked a job, you're familiar with the word performance review, right? Some of us like that time when it comes along. It equals into cha-ching, maybe a raise. Some of us know that we haven't been doing such a good job and we may uh, not be looking forward to that because we won't be getting a raise. It's that debt that's owed to you. But, but what we're talking about here is that with God, there's no areas of performance. He doesn't meet with you on an annual basis and give you a performance review. He, he doesn't say, uh, let me look to see how your attitude is with others. Let me see how your ability to work with others is. Let me, let me see if you uh, are, are quick to complete tasks as assigned. And then he gives you an overall rating. Are you a one or are you a five? Five being best. Five being uh, I, you walk on water. No pun intended, but that's, you know, from one to the other. I'm so glad. You guys should be saying hallelujah and amen because, you know, you ain't, and I'm not, you know, considered uh, by God to have to be reviewed every year. And, and so in that, there's, there's a great relief. But what that comes into is that we have to trust God for his goodness and we have to believe God that, that he's going to keep his word and what he says is true. In verse 4, we're told about a physical aspect. He brings in a physical example of one who works. And he says the wages are counted as grace. Uh, I'm sorry, not counted as grace, but as debt. You work a job, you expect payment. You make X amount an hour, or you make X number of salary per month, and you're putting in your time you're clocking, you know, checking the clock, punching the clock, and you expect a paycheck, don't you? You'd be very surprised after a month's work or a week's work. It's like, oh, sorry, it's all by grace. Sorry, love ya. It's great what you did. No, no, you owe me money, right? You owe it to me. I worked 40 hours this week. And I want my money. I want my pay. No, not, not, not with Abraham. You see, he, he didn't work for his right standing with God, nor did he try to earn his standing as a rightful wage. It's not what Abraham was going after. No, he, he, he took his place with the rest of the ungodly people. He had to remember also that even his own father, Terah, they lived in a pagan land. He belonged to a pagan family. Yet God comes to him, and says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. As much as the sands upon the earth. While he was still in a, in a, in a, in a pagan lifestyle even. That's what he knew. He wasn't a Jew. He was, he was a, in a sense, a, a Gentile in that sense. He, there was nothing there as far as Jew or Gentile yet. It, it, it was just them. And, and so now, even with this, he believes. He believes before he's even circumcised, right? And I'll bring that proof text up to you a little later. But in this, um, verse 5 then says, just, uh, or, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies in godly, has faith that is accounted to him. So God justifies the ungodly, not the righteous. Matthew 9, 11 through 13 says, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? An accusation upon our Lord. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician. Only those who are sick, righteous, unrighteous. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, that, that's what the reason Jesus came, or one of the reasons he came. To call the righteous unto salvation, or to call the, 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 um, the sinners unto salvation, not the righteous. 
Abraham understands this evidently, and he has no problem placing himself under that idea because he knows full well that he cannot do it on his own. In verses 6 through 8, we read now that Paul brings in David and he calls him to the witness stand. And he's going to be using a portion of David's psalm out of Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. That's verses 7 and 8. But he says that David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Again, Paul is bringing that same point and saying righteousness is apart from works. Paul is going to quote a psalm, that's Psalm 32, and in that, about a person who is a sinner, in other words, and he's being forgiven. He's a sinner, he's being forgiven. He knows he's a person who has an earned forgiveness or righteousness. But nonetheless, this is a person who is a sinner who's been graciously forgiven. And that's the place that David is at. And Paul, in using that Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, it shows forgiveness, it shows a covering, it shows a promise by God not to credit the sin any longer to your account. I was speaking to a brother between service and he says, hey, Tom, think about this too. Kind of blows me away in that before any of us were in this room were born, Jesus died for your sins. But it's all the sins in the future that you're going to make. How many? What's the percentage? A hundred percent. Jesus died to pay for 100% of every future sin that you and I are going to commit. That's exactly the gravity of this, of this forgiveness and the covering and the promise that God, that he's not going to impute sin any longer to your, to your account. Corey Ten Boom said this, when we confess our sins, God casts them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. And even though I cannot find a scripture for it, I believe God then places a sign out there that says, no fishing allowed. Do you get it? No fishing allowed. You're not to go back and try and fish for that sin. All right? Go fishing for it. Some biblical proof on that is 1 John 1, 1.9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you, do you believe those words is my question to you this morning. Because so many of us, and maybe you here in this room, you live with guilt. You're living with condemnation. And do you understand that living in guilt and condemnation goes completely against what God's word says? And basically, if you're living in guilt and condemnation, you're basically saying to God, I don't believe you. I don't believe you, Lord. Well, the Lord's saying, but I said in my word that if you confess, I'm faithful and I'm just to forgive you of your sins. And then not only that, I'm going to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and I'm going to make you righteous. But yet we choose many times to live in uh, our lives in guilt, in condemnation, and that we're not good enough, which is false. And in that living in that way, we're, we are saying to God, I don't believe you. I don't believe what your word says. Another proof text for us. Revelation 1.5, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. There was a price paid for you. The most costly price, death. And by his blood, we are washed clean. Do you know that? We're washed clean by his blood. How about one more, Hebrews 8.12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Wow, you guys should be doing a happy dance right now. 
I mean, think about it. God is going to be merciful to us. To our unrighteousness, God is merciful. Our sins and those lawless deeds that we have done or will do in the future, He remembers them no more. How beautiful is that? What a great God we follow this morning. Isn't that something? In verse 8, God, or Paul says this word or this word written by King David. He says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. I want to bring to the surface that word impute because it means accounted or credited or reckoned. And what it is, it's an accounting term or a bookkeeping term, which means to enter into the account book. So it's like a bookkeeper or a uh, CPA. They're putting something in a ledger. Let's call it your life. The ledger of your life. Certain things are written in it. Certain things you want to, you write in yourself. Oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't know my Bible enough. Um, I'm not loved enough. The list goes on and on. A lot of things we're writing into our own account. This word impute, Paul uses 10 times in chapter 4. 10. So you got to ask yourself a question if we observe the text, right? Why is he writing it 10 times? Why, why is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit fallen under Paul to write this word 10 times in this chapter? Well, it's because God, I believe, wants us to kind of take notice of it. He wants us to take notice of what he's giving us and what he's taking away from us, and what he will not give to us in the sense of condemnation or, or, or impute things to us uh, uh, in the way of, of this justification and getting saved and such. Paul writes to Philemon about a, a servant by the name of Onesimus. And, and Paul then, because this Onesimus was kind of a renegade uh, um, a slave, and he went and ended up in Rome, and Paul meets up with him in Rome. He gets saved, and there's a whole life change that goes on within this um, servant. And yet Paul befriends this guy. He's a brother in the Lord, and Paul is appealing to Philemon now because Onesimus explains the story of what he's done. And so now Paul is saying to Philemon, but if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. Put it in my ledger. If he owes you anything, Philemon, add it to my account. You know, it's like if you go to a restaurant, you're known really well by somebody, you don't bring in the cash, but you go what? Put it on my tab, right? Isn't that what they're doing? They're putting it on your tab. They're putting it in your ledger that you owe them, you know, $25 for dinner. And so the next time, I mean, things used to be done that way in the olden times, right? Used to have that kind of tab going with the, the general store or the supermarket or something back in those days. And then you used to settle your account at the end of the month. That was way before my time. I just want to let you know that. But... <laughs> Um, I heard about that and read about that, okay? Um, let's put it this way. How about Jesus? Jesus on the cross. Jesus being crucified. He's being crucified for our sin, for your sin. He's being raised up on the cross. Nails through his hands and his feet, a spear through his side, a crown of thorns on his head, ridiculed, mocked, and scourged, all... For you. All for me. This is kind of the way that I think about it, is that Jesus would be on the cross saying to God the Father, he'd say it kind of this way, hey, hey, would you put their sin in my account? Would you put their sin, meaning the world's sin, 
into my account. And then put my righteousness in their account, meaning yours. Isn't that beautiful? See, that's really the great exchange that was displayed on the cross. The great exchange, your sin, my sin, for his righteousness. Um, I can't think, gosh, who made the better deal here? I think we made out pretty well, don't you think? Our sin is fully taken away. Your sin is gone, it's blotted out. And Paul is trying to make the point here with Abraham and David is that when you have become justified, when you have said yes to the Lord, you are saved, guess what? There's no longer a working of things. There's no longer an earning of things. You no longer have to check the box of your Christianity to say that, oh, I've done this, I've done this, I've done that. There's no longer the need for that. Because it's already done, it's finished. And Jesus on the cross by his death said, you know what, give me their sin and I will give them my righteousness. And he's done that. That's kind of the, the, that, that exchange, that two-way street of the taking and the giving that was experienced on the cross. What's Paul's point in this though? Well, there's three things I believe. We have to remember that number one, Paul is trying to demonstrate in, through the scriptures that a person, that's you and me, okay, we're people, that a person is not made righteous by doing good works. You're not made righteous by doing good deeds. You're not made righteous by, by how much you give to a church. You're not made righteous by how many times you, you, you buy Girl Scout cookies. You're not made righteous by how many times you um, uh, um, uh, do nice things for people. You think you're adding that to your account, the goodness of things, to your account for the good graces of God. So that'll help us get our way into heaven. But that's not how it works. That, that's not how God designed it to work. That's not within his, his mathematical equation. His mathematical equation is salvation by faith. That's it. Salvation plus faith, not plus anything else. So this, Paul is bringing out in these scriptures, a person isn't made righteous or anything by doing good works, but by having faith, just by having faith alone. The second thing, as he brings in David's psalm in verse 7 and 8, it's not obviously coming from a person who thinks he's perfect. David knows he's not perfect. After Nathan had brought him the news of Bathsheba and, and everything that he had done, the first words from his mouth was like, I have sinned against the Lord. I've sinned against God. David knows he's not a perfect person. So that's not coming from a heart when you read this of a part, person who thinks he's perfect. David's song, the third thing is David's song is coming from a, the point of a person who's a sinner and he knows he's a sinner and yet he's found forgiveness. Why? Because God said that if you come to me, I will forgive you. Come to me and repent, you will be forgiven. David knew that. David counted on that. David believed that. And that's where he found forgiveness. And as we know and understand in Psalm 32 is that psalm where David is pouring his heart out to the Lord because of his transgression of Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah the Hittite. When we come to that understanding, that's what he's talking about. We realize then that David has done absolutely nothing to deserve God's forgiveness. Absolutely nothing. But he believed. He believed. He didn't run around the palace 32 times. He didn't do certain things like I was told growing up I needed to do for absolution. It's not how it works. And I'm really thankful for that. I'm very thankful for that. Instead, David, he, he received forgiveness because he had a broken spirit and a contrite heart, right? He repented. 
Not because of his sacrifices. He didn't have to go out and do anything. Oh my goodness, this is what I've done. I've sinned against you, Lord. Now I've, think about it. I mean, there's nowhere in scripture that tells us that David went out and sacrificed anything as unto the Lord. A sin offering. He didn't do that. All he did was repent. All he did was ask forgiveness from God. Because he believed God would give it to him. No sacrifice was involved. David was made righteous because of his faith, not his works. There's something then that we need to cover a little further here is that justification then requires a double accounting. Negatively, first, God will never count our sins against us. Positively, God credits our account with righteousness as a free gift by faith, which is apart from our works, totally apart from it. Listen, guys, I'm going to keep that up there for a little while so you can soak it in a little bit. I know it's kind of confusing, maybe hard to palate or hard to wrap our minds around. But in this, Paul is stating here in the scriptures that, guess what? Um, God never will add to an account of, into your account, sin. He takes that from us. But he adds to your account his righteous, his righteousness. That gift. And you didn't earn it. You didn't do anything to receive it. So what is Paul doing? Paul is taking that eraser and he says that God takes this eraser and he, this giant eraser of, of your sin and my sin and he just wipes it out. Isn't that great? <laughs> Isn't that great? God just wipes it out. Uh, time for a happy dance again. Sorry. Just saying. Because he wipes it out. It's gone. You don't longer have to live in condemnation. You no longer have to live in guilt. You have to believe, though, what the Word of God says. He, he wipes it out from the, the check and balance ledger list of our lives. I think we should then, at this point, think about other people. People you might know. Maybe even yourself who thinks, well, I'm a really pretty good person. I do this and I do that. I'm, I'm generally a good person and I'm okay with myself, so I must be okay with God. I don't do these things. I'm a pretty good individual. Well, it doesn't work that way. God's wiped out your ability of works to get to heaven. He's wiped it out completely. He says, uh-uh, he's kind of got his ears covered. No, no, blah, 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 blah. Right, right, he's saying that, you know. I'm not going to hear you. It's not about works. But Lord, I've done this for you. But Lord, I'm going to do that for you. And Lord, I've got these good intentions. La, 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 la. That's what he does. It's not within what he's about. He doesn't operate this way. He says, but if you believe, if you put your faith and your trust in me, that's what I want to hear. That's the way to get to heaven. In verses 9 through 12, he says, Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Here's the answer. Not while he was circumcised, but uncircumcised. And he received a sign, important word, a sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith, which he had while, get this, was still uncircumcised. That he might be the father of all those who believe. Though they are uncircumcised, that, the, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who are not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in their steps of faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Oh, it sounds a little confusing. 
Those walking in it, those who have been, those who haven't been. Paul, kind of, what are you saying here? Well, understand the argument now he's bringing. He's brought up two testimonies, two witnesses, Abraham, and he's brought up David. He cited from their Old Testament scriptures, the Psalms, and the book of Genesis. And now his argument, or his closing argument for this, in this case would be, let's now look, since I've been bringing to you the idea that justification is by faith, it's not by works, well, let me now bring up my closing argument. And he says, opens it with that, and then he says, there's two questions in this. One is, when was Abraham justified? When was Abraham saved? Turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15 in the Old Testament. We're going to take a look at a real simple verse. Turn in your Bibles there. Genesis 15, 6. The question is, when was Abraham justified by faith? When was he saved? In verse 6 it says, And he believed in the Lord... And he accounted it to him for righteousness. There's nothing previous to that about he being saved through circumcision. About he being saved through works, in other words. Brings us to another question then. When was Abraham circumcised then? If he wasn't circumcised when he believed by faith, then when was he circumcised? We'll turn to Genesis 17. Genesis 17, a couple of chapters over. Look at 22 through 27. Then he finished talking with him. And God went up from Abraham. Don't you love that? It's like God just chilling, talking with Abraham. I love it. I love it. I don't know. Floats my boat. I love it. So Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all who were born in his house, and all who were brought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins, that the very same day, that very same day, as God had said to him. Verse 24. Get this. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very same day, Abraham was circumcised, and his son Ishmael. And all the men of his house were born in the house, or born in the house, or brought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. So what is Paul trying to prove in this here? With this question is the fact that Abraham was saved before he was circumcised. That circumcision wasn't the requirement for salvation, for justification. We are saved by faith, believing, not by any works. So, in fact, the, the time of span between 15.6 and 17.22 through 27 is a span of the age accounted by Ishmael's age, which is about 13 years of age. So we're looking at about 13 years from the time that Abraham said yes to the Lord, he became justified by faith to the time actually circumcision began. So, so works is not the issue. Works does not save you. Works does not get you in good graces with God. The texts are there to show us that and to prove us that. And really understanding the heart of God. God isn't saying, do, do, do for me at all. God is just saying, believe in me. Follow me, believe in me, love me. One commentator said this, faith only was a Gentile principle long before it was a Jewish reality. Remember, back in that time when, when, when Abraham was asked to leave, there was no Jew. There was no Jewishness going on. It was just this guy named Abraham who, was follow, who lived in a pagan family, in a pagan land, and God said, bam, you're it. If you believe, I'm going to make you a father of all nations. And Abraham said, yes, I believe. So, so then why circumcision? Why did God then bring in 13 years later circumcision onto the scene? Because it really, circumcision, it wasn't the work that attained 
him a right relationship with God, was it? It wasn't the circumcision that is. So then why is God then bringing in circumcision? Well, it was a sign of faith, circumcision, not a substitution for faith. It was only a sign. It wasn't to take the place of. We might equate it today with baptism. Baptism today is a sign of faith for you and me today. It's not a substitute for salvation as others believe. There's other churches that teach that you need to be baptized to be saved. Well, that contradicts and goes against and flies in the face of the scriptures and even what we read today. It makes no sense. You have to believe first. Baptism is just that, 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 that outward declaration, proclamation of what God has been doing in your life on the inside. So true like circumcision, which was a sign of faith, water baptism is also a sign of faith, saying, I'm proclaiming to the world that I'm a Jesus freak, that I follow Christ. That's my sign to the world. Well, circumcision was that intention of that as well, but we know that it got twisted and a little perverted later on. Baptism today is a sign of faith for you and me today. But Tom, the scripture says that you must believe and be baptized. And, you know, hey, I, absolutely. I, I believe that the minute we get saved, we declare, we, we, we come to the faith, we put our trust and belief in God, just like Abraham did. Okay, let's get you baptized. It's a sign. It's not a substitution. Once we believe, we, we should get baptized. Jesus tells us we need to do this. He says, making disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a command by Jesus that we're to do that. But the command is for salvation uh, in that sense. Uh, not for salvation, but for identification. He says, you're already saved. Now proclaim it. Now, 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 now tell the world. It's for identification not for salvation. Because, remember, as I've been saying, a sign is not a substitute. Right? So as in Paul's day, they dealt with circumcision. In our day, we might be today saying we deal with this baptism question. So before the seal of circumcision came was God's covenant of faith with Abraham. So in the second section that we covered, Paul just totally rips wide open the robe of ritual, doesn't he? The ritual of circumcision. From top to bottom, the veil is torn. As Kiri comes up um, in closing, we, I know that I'm saved. I pray that you guys know that you're saved. I'm saved not because of the things that I've done or the things that I'm doing in the will of the Lord, but I'm saved today and I'm confident in my salvation because of who I'm trusting in for my salvation. Who are you trusting in for your salvation? Is it your good works? Is it the fact that you read your Bible 20 times a day? You're checking the box of your Christianity walk. Is, is, that, is, that, is that it? Is that what makes, makes it for you? Is that what you think makes it for you? It all goes back to, even in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, to where even the father, Abraham, believed. That's all he did. He believed and he walked with God. And, and that may be for some of us today. So what about you this morning? Are, are you looking for some kind of a religious thing? Some kind of a religi religious uh, thing to save you? Are, are you looking for some kind of um, um, acceptance in some way by God, by doing things, by earning things. Earning, earning that's, a, that's a working word, earning. If, if that's where you're at and that's where you think you, 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 you're to go, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. 
at all. For us to get to heaven, we need to hear the same exact message that was preached to the Jews. It's all about faith. It's all about faith. We can't earn our way to heaven, in other words. But we can believe our way there, right? Just like David, he knew he was a man who wasn't perfect. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we know we're not perfect. But we believe in the forgiveness of God. We believe his word. We believe what he says is true. His testimonies are true. We should never, ever doubt them. We should never doubt the word of God. Are, are you doing that today? Are, are, are you doubting the word of God? Or are you believing in God's word? You got to think about this. Maybe this is a time of inter introspection, you know, kind of looking inside and saying, well, Lord, what is my relationship like with you? Am I relying upon my own, my own works, my own will, my own way, my own earning? What am I, what am I, what am I about with you, Lord? Maybe it's time for you to take evaluation, take stock in your relationship with Jesus. Because all Jesus wants you to do is believe. Believe in his word. Maybe you feel alone. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Maybe you feel like, oh man, it's just so heavy right now. Man, there's things on my life that's so heavy. God says, you know, my burden is light. My yoke is easy. It's believing His Word. That's what it's about. Believing, taking Him at His Word. You know, after Kiri sings, if there's any of you this morning that would like prayer, maybe you're, you've, been, you've been running a heavy-duty guilt trip on yourself and heavy-duty condemnation, and, you know, maybe you're like that little one in the back crying out to the Lord saying, hey, you know what? I, I just need to hear from you this morning, Lord. You know, if that's, if that's you this morning, then I want you to come up for prayer afterwards, okay? And get prayed for and ask God to, to liberate you, to free you from that bondage and that weight that entangles you. That's what it is. It's a weight. It's a heavy weight when you're walking in bondage. You're walking in condemnation. You're walking in guilt. It's all of those things and it, and it just, it's a weight and it's dragging you down. Cut it off. Cut it off. Walk freely with Jesus this morning. Let him free you. He's the only one that can, not me. He can free you. But you got to let him. You got to let him free you. You got to let him release you. For, he's going to release you from that bondage. You got to want to, though. So today might be that day for you, huh? Just let yourself go in Jesus. Just love him. Believe him. Believe his word. Enjoy, man, enjoy your relationship with Christ. Our relationship with Jesus is not heavy. It's light, man. It's so light.